All right, we will go ahead and get started. So first off, I wanted to just say thank you for everyone uh, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for being a part of our P2 webinar series. If you don't know what P2 is, that is the Pollution Prevention. Um, and this is titled the TRI Reduction Successes and Case Study. So TRI, if you're unfamiliar, is the Toxic Release Inventory. Today we are going to be hearing from Ezekiel Velez from the U.S. EPA Region 4. He is the TRI coordinator, a good friend of mine, very knowledgeable, and uh, I'm just very excited to to hear from him and for him to teach us a little bit more about the toxic release uh, inventory database, um, how to use that, and then some, some numbers from um, 2018, I think. Um, those are the most recent. So everyone is muted upon entry to reduce the amount of background noise. So if you have any comments or any questions, please feel free to use the chat box to ask those questions or um, tell your comments. I'm actually right now sending one to everyone. So you should be seeing that over in the right hand side. There's the, the chat box option. Um, I, I just sent one out to, to try to show where, where that is. So um, this will be recorded and put onto our website. So um, you don't feel like you have to take a bunch of notes. You'll be able to run back through it and listen to it again once it's over. Also, um, there will be copies of the presentation sent out to everyone that was registered, so they will. You know, you don't you don't really need to take notes. Just just listen to our our great speakers. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ezekiel. He is an environmental scientist in the Land Chemicals and Redevelopment Division within USA EPA Region Four and currently serves as the Region 4 Toxics Release Inventory Coordinator. So as the coordinator, he provides compliance assistance and interpretive guidance to industries and helps the public, environmental, and community groups access and analyze the TRI, TRI data, which is sort of what he's going to be doing here today. So without further ado, I pass it off to Ezekiel. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, that everyone can hear me clearly. As uh, Caleb uh, mentioned, I've been with the agency about 29 years now and uh, primarily have worked uh, under the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act and specifically focusing more on the toxic release inventory. And what I want to do today is kind of give you an overview of the toxic release inventory. In addition to that, I'm going to give you some uh, data uh, for the region and then kind of narrow down into the state of Tennessee. And then I will finish up with uh, the pollution prevention tool and uh, specifically talk about uh, some options for source reductions and use some examples of different industries that have actually already reported to the P2 tool under the TRI, okay? So uh, what I'm gonna do just for uh, make it a little bit more easier. I'm going to put a short video now that will introduce what TRI is. So uh, here goes the first video. In 1986, Congress passed the
Okay, so that kind of gives you a quick overview of what the TRI is. So I'm gonna to try to now uh, explain it a little bit more detailed. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the TRI is actually a resource tool. It's a database that will help uh, track releases and waste management activities for about 21,000 facilities across the United States. It covers uh, close to 675 toxic chemicals and chemical categories. And it's reported uh, releases, it includes waste management transfers, recycling activities, and also pollution prevention. So that's pretty much uh, what the TRI is. How it started, it was actually created because of an incident that happened uh, originally in 1984 in Bhopal, India, of methyl oxycyanate that actually triggered uh, you know, over 2,000 deaths, and actually following that, about 15,000 more people died uh, due to long-term health effects. And about more than 150,000 people were actually treated at hospitals and, uh, across Bhopal uh, because of this incident. Uh, a year later, uh, in 1985, there was uh, a similar incident, which thank God did not have those consequences, but in the Institute of West Virginia. And that actually prompted Congress to create the Emergency Planning and Community Rights to Know Act, which was actually passed in 1986. So at this point, we have close to 34 years uh, worth of data uh, for the toxic release inventory. Uh, the TRI, or the Toxic Release Inventory, is actually one section of the law of the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. It's actually called uh, Section 313. So uh, there are other laws which we're not going to discuss today, but they also pertain to EFRA. One of the things to keep in mind is when we talk about TRI, uh, TRI has very specific requirements for industries to report. They have to be in a covered sector. They have to have 10 full-time employees or the equivalent of 20,000 hours of work during the year. And then they actually have to either manufacture, process, or otherwise use a toxic chemical above a certain threshold. So the company meets those four requirements, then they're actually required to submit a report to the toxic release inventory. So uh, what are the sectors that are covered? We're gonna go through in a little more detail uh, in, in a minute, but some of them are manufacturing, coal mining, hazardous waste, management facilities, and that have 10 full-time employees. Now, uh, just to make it a little bit easier, originally, before 1998, only the manufacturing sector was covered. They used to be called uh, standard industrial certification code 20 to 39, which was any company was manufacturing something and they use, you know, these chemicals above a certain threshold, they were required to report. In 1998, EPA actually added uh, a seven new sectors, okay, and including federal facilities, those are metal mining, coal mining, liquid facilities, TSD facilities, salt recovery services, chemical distributors, and pole, uh, petroleum bulk terminals and as I mentioned, by executive order of federal facilities. So those are the sectors that are covered. And the reason why I mentioned this is because there's some companies who are not covered, some sectors that are not covered. So those that are listed here are actually covered and required to report if they meet all the criteria for reporting. Now, uh, apart from the sectors and the number of employees, a company has to meet a very specific threshold. If a company is actually manufacturing or processing more than 25,000 pounds of a toxic chemical during the whole calendar year, they're required to report. And that means that they're creating the chemical or they're processing a chemical. That means incorporating a chemical into product for food distribution into commerce, that's 25,000 pounds. If a company is otherwise using a chemical, like, like, like let's say a solvent for cleaning the press for printing, then it will be 10,000 pounds. Then EPA actually established a lower threshold in the year 2000 for what they call PBT chemicals, persistent by cumulative and toxic chemicals. And those will range from 100 pounds to 10 pounds for highly toxic and 0.1 grams for the oxygen, the oxygen like compounds. So uh, those are the basic requirements uh, 
for for TRI. So again, they have to meet a specific sector. And I'm going to go back really quick just to show you. They have to be in a covered sector that we mentioned originally. They have to have 10 full-time employees or the quarter 20,000 hours. They have to manufacture, process, or otherwise use a TRI chemical, and they have to exceed a threshold of any of those chemicals in order to report. So those are the basic uh, requirements that we have for TRI. Now, what is a release according to the TRI? A release actually would be any release by any industrial facility covered to the air, water, land, and underground injection. So those are the four categories, and that's what's unique about TRI. You know, of course, if you work in the air division or the water division, they only handle air or water division issues. TRI actually covers all sectors or all media, in this case, air, water, land, and even the underground injection. So if you see the threshold for a chemical, and you have any releases in any of these four areas, air, water, land, or underground injection, you're actually required to cover and submit those releases to those four media on the form R of the toxic release inventory. Now, what's reported on the form, uh, on-site releases to the either air, water, land, or underground injection, but also off-site transfers. And it could be off-site transfers for releasing it to, to the disposal to the landfill, like a reckless fatality landfill, or it could be actually sent off-site for further waste management. So you also report waste management activities, and those can be both either on-site or off-site. And it will be the recycling, treatment for destruction, or in the recovery. In addition, you have to report any type of pollution prevention activities that you may have done for that particular chemical. Now, one thing I want you to keep in mind, uh, TRI is a yearly report. Uh, different from NII, NEI, which actually says every three years, this is a, a yearly report. And this is kind of shows you the cycle for which companies have to report. From January uh, until July or June, companies are reporting. The due date for reporting is actually July 1st of every year, and you report for the prior year. So the first few months of the year, companies are gathering the data that actually they have in order to report any type of emission they have actually had during the prior year. So July 1st is reported. About 30 days later, uh, about July 30th, 31st, we actually do a preliminary data release, So, which means we haven't done much data quality to it, but we are reporting whatever the company actually sent to EPA. We immediately release that within 30 days of being reported to the public. And that's why we actually emphasize the importance of reporting accurately. Then we go through a process of data quality review uh, from, you know, the end of July all the way down to uh, October. And then we actually publish a final data uh, sometime in November. Oh, well, actually, what I mean by that is we freeze the data and we start creating what we call the national analysis which usually occurs sometime in January or February, depending how much we advance in this process. So anyhow, that's, that's kind of an overview of how uh, the TRI actually uh, is managed through the whole year. Now I want to also show you a quick video of once we receive the data, what we actually do with the data. And this is what we do. We create something called the TRI National Analysis. And let me give you this short and quick uh, video.
that's actually what we create every single year. We actually create a report which gives you summaries of releases for the current year and then actually trend analysis for um, the last several years. It also gives you kind of an idea of uh, reports of how many sectors are reporting the amounts that each sector are reporting. In addition to that, there's actually not just a national summary, but some regional summary and state summaries too that come along with that national analysis. This what you have now on your screen is actually a short, uh, a quick uh, overview of how many facilities are reporting. As I think I mentioned, there were over 20, about 21,000 facilities nationwide that are reporting currently to the toxic release inventory. Now in region four, we actually have eight states, as you can see in the screen, uh, and we have about 66.4 million people living in these uh, eight states. Uh, we have close to 4,600 facilities that are currently reporting to the TRI. And an interesting fact is that region four covers about 20 percent of the U.S. population and includes about 21 percent of all facilities that report to the TRI. So we have a large number of industries here in the southeast. Uh, quickly on the right hand side in the middle there you see that the sectors that are primarily reporting in region four are chemical manufacturing and paper or pulp and paper. Those are the two major sectors and we'll see more of that in a minute in a different slide. Now this is kind of a quick uh, overview of uh, Region 4. As you can see, uh, about 4,600 facilities in Region 4 reporting. The total production-related waste uh, is close to 6.2 billion pounds just for 2018. Uh, the good news about that is that only 8% of that amount is actually being released to the environment, which means 92% of the waste created through, during this process of creating different products from industries is actually managed in, in a way that it's not released, either by energy recovery, by treatment, or by recycling, which in this, in this case particularly about 61% is actually done through recycling. So that kind of gives you a quick overview for the region, which includes eight states. The industries that are reporting in our region, we have about 16% are chemical industries, uh, and then followed by 15% of non-metallic mineral products, and then 10% fabricated metals. Then you can see the rest of them. Now, the interesting part, those are the industries that we have the most of by number of facilities. But the little bullet that you see in the bottom shows that chemical manufacturing is actually the sector that has the most releases, followed by paper, in this case, pulp and paper companies and electric utilities. As you can see, pulp and paper and electric utilities don't even show up in the top industries here on the number of facilities reporting, which means they have less facilities, but they are actually releasing more chemical to the environment than those other companies. This gives you a quick uh, snapshot uh, from 2007 to 2018 of what we call the total related waste. That means not just releases, but the amount is treated on site or off site, the amount is used for energy recovery, and how much is actually recycled. As you can see, uh, about 6.3 billion pounds of waste created, and 61% of that actually managed to recycling. There's a big jump from 2017 to 2018 and it's primarily driven by one facility, a state big and innovative plastic in Alabama, who reported a huge increase of recycling of dichloromethane for 2018. Uh, the next thing that you see here is actually a total releases and disposals for Region 4, and you can see kind of the trend. If you go back here to 2007, you can see the the trend in air releases is going down, uh, and they have pretty much stabilized from 2017 to 2018. And the same thing that the land uh, releases have kept pretty much the same, and the same thing for outside disposal. But there has been definitely some reductions uh, through the years uh, for releases in Region 4. 
if you want to look at the top five chemicals, these are the top five chemicals for air releases and also for water releases, specifically for Region 4. So that includes all eight states. And methanol, for example, that's not surprising because that's actually most of that comes from pulp and paper industries, which is the second uh, primary sector in our region. Okay. And then you see the one in the right hand side, which is actually water releases. So that's actually the top five chemicals in the whole region of chemicals that are being released in the environment. This will give you also kind of a quick overview of a trend analysis from 2003 to 2018, specifically for land releases. The reason why I separate this in two different colors is because the green ones will represent releases on site from companies. And then the orange one will represent transfers off-site for disposal. So a lot of companies are not releasing their chemicals on-site, but they're transferring off-site to a different location to actually dispose of the chemical. Now I want to narrow this down to Tennessee specifically so we can have a better idea of what's going on in Tennessee. If you look, there's about 606 facilities who reported for 2008, 18, I'm sorry, for 2018, 606. And they have created about 451 million pounds of total production-related waste. And out of those 450 million pounds, uh, 88.6 million pounds have been released either on-site or off-site. And one thing to note is that Tennessee actually ranks uh, seven out of 56 states and territory nationwide based on the total releases per square mile. So uh, that's actually a pretty high um, if you compare with other states. Now this gives you a kind of a overview quickly on just for 2018. There are about 450 million pounds, as I mentioned, for 2018 uh, of related waste created. And out of those, actually 20% are being released. If you remember national, there was about 8% of the total waste created was actually released. And Tennessee is a little bit higher. It's about 12% uh, higher than the national average. So out of the whole waste being created through these companies, 20% of them, 20% of that actually has been released uh, to the environment, either to the air, water, or to the lab. Now, we talk about total on-site releases, about 75 million pounds, and you see the distribution there, 64% uh, is actually to the land, 32% uh, to air, about 4% is actually releases to the water. And these are releases occurring on-site from those facilities, does not include those companies who are transferring outside releases to, to other, other sites away from their particular facility. Top five uh, industries or uh, companies reporting uh, for total disposal of the releases in Tennessee, specifically for 2018, you can see two of them are metal mining, the first one and the third one. And then uh, they actually are the second and third are actually part of the chemical industry. And the fifth uh, company, and ranks number five, is actually a electric utility plant. So it kind of gives you a quick uh, view on those industries who are uh, releasing the most in Tennessee. Now, uh, just to give you an idea of which uh, sectors or how the sectors rank in the state of Tennessee, this is specifically, this is the latest data that we have available to for 2018. Metal mining is the number one sector for total uh, uh, releases on and off-site with 29.5 million pounds, followed by chemical with 20 million pounds, and then primary metals with 8 million pounds, and electric utilities with 7 million pounds, and then paper, of open paper, uh, about 6 million pounds. So that shows you the top five uh, sectors or industries in 2018 in Tennessee. If you want to look at the top five chemicals in Tennessee, uh, I'll break it down for you in air and water. You can see that sulfuric acid is actually uh, the number one for air releases, and that's primarily coming from electric utilities. And then you also have, uh, you know, ammonia, and for water you have nitrate compounds, 
and also ammonia. And again, this is specifically for Tennessee for the year 2018. Just to show you a trend analysis uh, from 2003 to 2018, again, this is a total production-related waste and shows you releases, treatment, and recovery, and also the amount recycled. So it kind of shows you the change through the years of uh, releases of waste management actually created uh, in Tennessee. Now, this next slide, what I do is I took the bottom part of this graph and just broke it down for you just to show you the releases. So here you see the releases from 2003 to 2018. Actually, in 2003, it was 143 million pounds. In 2004, there was a slight increase to 158 million pounds. But if you see, that's actually a good reduction through the years. We actually did see a jump about 7 million pounds uh, from 2017 to 2018 for Tennessee specifically. So, uh, but in general, you can see the trend going down with the exception of this actually last year which mostly is attributed to the economy, the increase in manufacturing in, in most sectors, to be honest with you. Now, what I want to do is actually uh, take some time to talk about the Pollution Prevention Act in what we call the P2-2. Uh, the Pollution Prevention Act was actually uh, passed in 1990, and what it did actually extended the authority for EPA to go beyond just collecting release data and actually help EPA collect a little bit more information on waste management activities, which include not just releases, but chemicals are being treated for destruction, how much is being used for energy recovery, and as well as for uh, recycling. So as most of you probably know, there's a waste management hierarchy that EPA uses, of course, the top portion of that triangle shows the preferred option of source reduction followed by recycling. And then the less uh, preferable option, of course, uh, disposal or releases. So the goal is to be in the top of that pyramid in order to uh, have the, the best uh, waste management possible. Now, when you go to the form R, you're going to find that there's two different sections in the form that requires you to submit information for waste management and how you do any type of pollution prevention or source reduction. The first section is section 8.10. Now, this is not an optional section. This is actually a section that every facility who fills a Form R and reports for a chemical, they have to fill out. And you have to report what type of source activities you're doing. In fact, you're going to see later on about 49 different source codes that you can use, and we'll mention that later on. Then section 8.11 is actually what we call a optional narrative. So it gives company, uh, companies the uh, um, option to report more detailed information in order to explain to EPA how they achieved that source reduction that reported in section 8.10. And for us, that's very important because we're trying to push here uh, the companies to report more detailed information in order that other companies can see what they're doing and they can also imitate or practice the same type of, of source reduction activities on their site in order to reduce any further uh, emissions they can from their plant. So that's section 8.10 and section 8.11. Now what's the benefits of P2? As many of you know, it reduces financial cost. It also reduces environmental costs from due to health problems or environmental damage. And, the, and then something else is that EPA is actually making a big effort to recognize uh, industries as, you know, good neighbors and good business models. In fact, just last month in February, our regional administrator went to uh, South Carolina uh, to Greenwood and conducted a press release there live at Cooper Power Systems. And uh, I'll give you more details later on, but we're actually trying to use this data not just to promote P2, but to also recognize those industries that are actually implementing any source reduction uh, projects. Uh, EPA also does what they call a P2 spotlight series. So they're actually highlighting in different reports that they create in a national analysis and other reports. 
uh, what industry is actually doing. So the more you write in Section 8.11, the more information we have to create these uh, spotlight series, P2 uh, reports to inform not just the community but other sectors what you're doing. I already mentioned this uh, one way or the other in two slides before about Section 8.10. In Section 8.11, 8.10 is the required information that you have to submit using your source reduction codes. And then 8.11 is actually the open response section, which allows you to give you give more detail of what type of source reduction activities you implemented. Now, here are the 49 codes, and we won't mention all of them, but just to give you an idea, once you fill in Section 8.10, this is what you will use. You can report for in, within all these different categories and then they have within a the category, they have very specific codes that you have to choose from in order to best represent the type of, of source reduction activity that you have implemented at your facility. Now, once a company has done uh, source reduction, uh, some of them can continue to do it through the years, but unfortunately, it gets to a point where you can reduce more because you have done a lot of reduction. So then you have to report any barriers that you actually have uh, to source reduction. For example, the electric utility has had a huge amount of reductions in hydrochloric acid in, in, in HF also. So it comes to the point where they actually have some barriers uh, which does not allow them to reduce more their releases because they have done pretty much all they can do. So you can actually report those barriers using those codes under Section 8.10. Now, uh, what I want to finish uh, is with a couple examples really quick on the P22, the pollution prevention tool that we have available on our website. What you can do is actually look at other companies who are in the same sector that you are in, and you can actually do a search by chemical, by sector, to find out what other companies are doing regarding source reduction. Okay, so that will be the website that you see there in the link. And then uh, what you're going to find is something like this. You can actually highlight show P2 info for facility, and then you can select here a specific industry group. For example, I chose paper, a pulp and paper industry, and I, I said, okay, I want to find out what, what, what is the paper industry doing and any type of reduction they have had. So I kept it general for all chemicals and used this range from 2009 to 2019. So once I hit uh, show P2 activities, it will open up this other page here. And what it does for you is going to give you the name of the facility, the address, the chemical for which they actually did the source reduction, the year, and it gives you the current amount and also what they reported the prior year. For example, this particular industry, Georgia Pacific, implemented uh, a source reduction activity which allowed them to have more than 99% reduction. And it went from 12,000 pounds to about 86 pounds in, uh, from 2007 to 2017. So that's a pretty big, significant reduction. How they accomplish it, i tell you right here, the source reduction activity, they actually placed the bark of burning a power boiler with natural gas. And you can see the same thing, uh, for example, and for the other company here in the bottom, and hexane, they have an 89% reduction. It tells you what they have for one year and the type of source reduction that they actually practice. In their particular case, they actually work to reduce quantity of solvent needed uh, to produce the final product. So anyhow, that gives you an idea of, of what you can find out uh, that other company are doing in those sectors. So again, there's a quick view. You can choose uh, the sector. In this case, I chose food industries. You can actually be more specific. You, you can say, okay, I want to find out what the food industry is actually doing in source reduction for ammonia. So you write the chemical, and you can even limit the year, or you can keep it in general. Then you hit here, show P2 activity. And that will actually open up for you and give you a report. Again, it gives you the name of the industry, the address, the, the prior year amount, the current year amount, and then it spells for you what they actually did. Here is the, the, the pollution prevention activity. This information that you see here is actually what you write in Section 8.11. 
it takes what's in section 8.10 here in the top, and then in the bottom it gives you a description of what's actually done specifically in order to reduce those emissions. Another example, let's say plastic uh, and rubber industry, okay? You have all chemicals. So once you do that run, you have, for example, the name of the company, and it shows you this particular company uh, who had uh, these reductions. Let's look at the last one here. You see they reported 150,000 pounds of trichloroethylene, and then they actually had a 62% reduction. It tells you the source reduction that they did. They actually installed a vapor recovery system, okay, which allowed them uh, to to reduce their emissions about 62%. So what that does, it tells you, okay, if you're in that sector, the plastic and rubber sector, you can go to the TRI P2 tool, do a search by sector for chemical, and maybe you can find out if you have not implemented that type of source reduction, and then you can examine to see if you can implement that, and that will allow you to have a new source reduction project. Let me just give you one quick example here. If you look at, at chemical industry, you're actually in the plastic and rubber industry, okay? Specific to nitrate compounds. If you see these are the red, it's actually the releases. There was a huge reduction from 2010 to 2011. And so when I see that, I have to find, okay, did something happened at that company that they reduced uh, the amount of releases by 100, by almost 100,000 pounds from one year to the other. So the question is, what did they do? So we go to the TRI Pollution Prevention Tool, and we do a search, okay? And we'll find out what they did. So look at this, for example. For nitrate compounds, this shows you in the tool, when you create a report, you can see for 2011, Tremco treated most of it for destruction. They had very little, almost no releases. Now compare the same sector, the plastic and rubber, for all other companies reporting to plastic and rubber, uh, which are 13 total for nitrate compounds, they had more than 75% released to the environment. So when you look at this chart, you can tell that Trenco Inc. and National Ohio did something different that allowed them to have almost zero releases compared to the rest of the sectors reporting for the same chemical. So when you go to the database, you do a search for plastic and rubber, uh, specifically uh, for, for those chemicals, and you find out for example, Tremco has the last one here, that they actually did it for nitrate compounds. And they actually had a 100% reduction. And well, they did a source reduction project, and they modified the equipment layout and piping, which allowed them specifically to have a zero reductions in nitrate compounds. So again, it just points you to figure out what other companies have done in order to have uh, reductions, and you can discover, you can implement the same thing in your particular facility. Now, I want to close with this one here. This is the company I mentioned before that we just recognized in February of a region administrator went to Greenville, South Carolina, and it's Cooper of Power Systems. They actually are a part of the electrical equipment and component manufacturing. And they specifically manufacture industrial and commercial electrical equipment. So they're in the name code. 335999, something else. You can even do a three digit code or you can be very specific and write down the sixth NAIC code digit for your industry. Then you can also write, you know, the chemical, chromium and chromium compounds. And once you do and hit, you know, the enter key, it's going to give you a table and it will search those companies that have reported for that sector for that chemical. For example, uh, Cooper Power Systems they actually reduced 99% of their emissions from 5,820 of chromium in uh, chromium compounds to uh, 17 pounds released. And uh, as you can see, the way they did this was actually by recycling, uh, by finding a recycling outlet for scrap capacitors, which resulted in shift from offsite transfer of chromium from land disposal to recycling. And you can see also here the different type of things that they did through the years for that particular chemical. So again, it shows you the, the type of effort that companies are going uh, to report. The more you report in section 8.11, the more you have in this section, and the more helpful will be 
for most of the, of the companies. I just kind of wrote it a little bit clear for you guys. So they reduced not just for chromium, but also for lead. For chromium, they had about 10,246 pounds in 2011, and they reduced their emissions to 10 pounds. That's a 99.9% .9 reduction for chromium. And the way they actually accomplished that is, like I mentioned, by finding a recycling outlet for the uh, scrap capacitors. But they also reduced their lead releases from 238 pounds in 2014 to about 20, 23 pounds in 2018. And that's more than 90% reduction. And, the, and how they accomplished this was actually by modifying the composition of the product uh, from soldier joints to epoxy bonded joints to eliminate lead. So again, if you're in this particular industry sector, uh, which is electrical equipment and component manufacturing, you can do a search uh, by, by the sector, you can do a search by chemical and discover what other companies are doing, and then you can actually decide if it's something that you can implement at your own industry to actually uh, have some sort of source uh, reduction activities. Anyhow, and I'll finish with this. Uh, just wanted to give you a few uh, websites where you can go to, to the TRP2 tool, also the TRI homepage, and other websites that we actually use that may be helpful for you. So anyhow, I hope uh, you find this helpful. There is my information, uh, my phone number, my email, and also uh, Douglas Chatham is uh, my assistant in the program and his phone number and his email also. So anyhow, I hope this, this is helpful, uh, and if there's any questions, I'll be more than glad to take them. Thank you so much, Ezekiel. We actually have quite a few questions uh, coming for you, but what I like to do is usually let um, both of our presenters speak, and then uh, we will hit those questions at the end. So, so stick around. We have, we have like five or six questions um, that, that came up during your presentation, but, but thank you so much for, for diving a little bit deeper into what the toxic release inventory is and uh, how to use the database and, and things like that. So from You're here, welcome. we will now, let's see, I would like to introduce Robert Brown. He is the Environmental and Safety Supervisor at Edge for Personal Care, uh, more specifically the shipping manufacturing in Knoxville. So he has over 25 years of experience and um, he is going to talk to us about a success story that they had over the ship for reducing TRI. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Robert. Thank you, Caleb. Can you hear us okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'd first like to thank Ezekiel for his presentation and I'd like to thank you for inviting us to be part of this meeting and you know, share our, our success here in Knoxville with the Schick plan, and uh, hopefully you know, give others out there some insight to what we did and maybe what they can do to achieve the same thing. Um, you actually go over to the SIG manufacturing yeah. presentation. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, um, as, as you can see with the, the brands that are up under the edge well, umbrella from Schick, um, across. Many of you probably are using some of these products already. And if you're not, you know, we invite you to try them out. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that went into this TC elimination project. And we're just going to highlight, you know, some of the major things that took place and uh, share with you um, what we did. Here we are, uh, razor blade manufacturer. Um, we supply a large number of the major store brand razor blades that are out there. Um, if you've ever bought a, a store brand, it was probably made right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, we're one of the world's largest producers of razor blades. So, you know, in, in this project that we wrapped up in 2017, we knew as a company the potential of using TC for the contamination side and Obviously, the remedial side, if there was any kind of releases, but you know, combined with the other factors of cost, as you see, and just the cost of TC and the disposal um, was very significant, and then the energy costs associated with it as well through the distillation processes, and then the regulatory risk associated with TCE. 
you know, made the project um, definitely a priority for us to focus on, on and put our efforts in to uh, uh, achieve. Uh, we wanted to obviously be a safer and more environmentally friendly partner to our community and to our colleagues. And we had the, you know, we had our entire team working on this. It just wasn't all the staff that's in this room and engineers, you know, the, all of our team played an important role in it. So we're very proud of the team that we have here. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know what TCE, trichloroethylene, uh, is, it's used in a couple of applications specifically, but we used it as a cleaning solvent in our liquid and vapor and cleaning degreasing operation. And the majority of it we were able to recycle on site for our carbon absorption distillation processes. Um, but, you know, the investment that went into the project to eliminate it, as you can see there, you know, half a million dollars to new cleaning systems and then overall two and a half million dollars for the entire project. It was a big undertaking and uh, many people in this room that I'm in right now were heavily involved in it. And uh, you know, we definitely set out to achieve this and we're very successful at it. Through the elimination, we were able to reduce our emissions of HAPS, the hazardous air pollutants, by almost 78%. And as you see, with the 23 tons per year on average, you know, it took us out of a Title V air emitter, and we're just now a true miner, a minor source potential to emit under air permit, um, which is a huge accomplishment if anyone's ever gone from a Title V to a minor source. You understand that. In addition, you know, we eliminated more than 50,000 pounds of hazardous waste that we generated through the use of TCE. And on approximate average of 374 tons of carbon dioxide greenhouse gases since the project was completed. We're very proud of that. And we knew that we were going to be able to see some great numbers come out of this project. But once we got into it, and actually um, started getting the data together. It's very, um, very exciting to see a lot of this information and how, how it was uh, obviously achieved. Um, some of the equipment and process here, I just want to kind of highlight the old TC clean wash boxes that you can see there. Uh, um, that equipment was more than 20 years old, and the plant designed and installed these hot air blow off systems to replace 12 of the base cleaning wash boxes in production. And this enabled us to pre clean um, not using any kind of chemicals. So, this right here was really big because we eliminated TTE right off from this area of our production and around our colleagues by going to this hot air blow-off system. The next process was probably the, the biggest part was um, more challenging is, as I say here, is trying to find, you know, something to replace our degreasing uh, cleaning of our blades. And the team worked with a company that specialized in vacuum parts cleaning technology and after many months of um, testing and uh, trying out some chemicals, we worked on a non-hazardous alcohol-based cleaner that uh, ended up proving ideal for the project. The equipment, um, the picture you see there of the old equipment to the left, that's actually taken the day it was headed out the door of the uh, building to uh, end its use, and then the new equipment to the right. We already had one set up and using it. So it was a very thought out process with lots of people, even outside of the facility, involved in all this. The pictures here just kind of give you a little view of our uh, CAU and it's the carbon absorption units that were in place um, under our Title V and then the area now. Um, very similar um, to what you see to the right. It was, you know, the cost, you know, so much related to the removal and disposal of all the equipment and the waste associated with it. 
and uh, then the new cleaning systems that were put into place. But um, this project, it, it took quite a long time to you know, make happen and get to the point to where we started the, the ball rolling, started bringing in equipment to remove equipment. And after all of, all of it was said and done, we were very proud of the, the outcome and the results of it. So we're just thankful to you know, be where we are now and actually be asked by the team to do this presentation to share with all of you you know, some of the things we went through. It's just a snapshot of what we did, but it, it took um, quite a long period of time once we started uh, to get it all wrapped up and completed, but um, the end result was obviously worth it. Really, that's, um, that's what we have. We really appreciate the opportunity to share this with you, and um, as Ezekiel, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you so much, Robert. And I think we're having a little bit of echo, bit so if you wouldn't mind. mind. Yeah, perfect. Um, but yeah, so let's see. We'll jump to these questions real quick. We had quite a few come in during Ezekiel's um, presentation. So let me do this. And I think I, I sort of forgot to introduce myself at the very beginning. I was so excited to hear these speakers in their presentation. Uh, my name is Caleb Powell. I'm an environmental scientist with TDEX Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices. Um, so I, I, I remembered that during during the, the start that I forgot to introduce myself. So sorry about that. So we'll jump to these questions. The first one, Ezekiel, we have about five for you. So um, the first one was, how many facilities in Tennessee would you guess are not reporting TRI but should be? Uh, that may be a difficult question for me to answer. I do the compliance assistant part. Uh, we have a different section, uh, actually division enforcement who does inspections. And they actually are the one who kind of target the, the type of, uh, that type of approach. But um, I know that in generally speaking, uh, there's been a, a good amount of companies reporting, to be honest with you, they have been consistently, hasn't changed too much from year to year. So even though there may be a small percentage of companies out there that may not be reporting, uh, I think in general most of them are reporting. Now, the, the key thing here would be is that they are actually, they can be reporting for one chemical and they can be missing a chemical from reporting. And that's what we have actually found out when we do inspections that sometimes they, they are reporting for some chemical but they may miss reporting for some other chemicals. But every year the agency actually does, uh, I think about 10% of their inspections are what they call data quality inspections. So they do more specific inspections, very detailed and thorough ones. Um, but again, it's it's really hard to have a number of non-compliance. Uh, now I can check with our enforcement people to see if they have numbers of how many cases they have done, let's say, for example, last year, and I'm sure they have some data on that. Yeah, I can see how that could be sort of hard to to track. Um, yeah, and I, if I can mention something else, just keep in mind, you have these three basic requirements. You have cover sector, you also have number of employees, and you have thresholds. So let's say one year you have less employees. So even though you may exceed the threshold, you're not required to report. Or well, let's assume that you cover, you're in the cover sector and you have the number of employees, but you go below the threshold, either because there was not too much demand for that chemical, for that product. So that, that could be, doesn't mean, the company didn't report, but there was a reason why they didn't report, because it didn't exceed the threshold for that chemical. So those are possibilities too, so keep that in mind. Awesome. So the next question is, how common is under or over reporting of values? Uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we do data quality. In fact, just this week, I sent 200 emails to 200 different facilities in our region alone for data quality. And we're looking at those who had increases the amount they reported on increases or the amount they actually reported as, as, as a decrease. Um, 
and uh, we looked at the amount they're reporting as waste management and also as as, as release. So we're targeting uh, companies who increase and decrease their releases, the major ones. And uh, in the past, we have found um, companies who have over-reported. And um, just recently, we had a, a, a call dealing with a company who over-reported. And uh, in fact, they weren't even required to report and they reported. And, and then had uh, another type of issue that came out uh, because of reporters calling in, and that's how we discovered that one. But uh, it's hard to put a number on that again, but we do do our data quality to to find out. And through the years, we have a good number of companies who do what they call revisions to the form. They revise the forms. And I don't have the number in front of me, but it's it's a good amount of numbers. It's probably hundreds of reports that are revised every year uh, because of these high qualities that we do. Yeah, and I think a good a good way to realize if you're under or over reporting um, a starting point would be just to be reporting uh, because then you could see those graphs and, and if it's a huge jump either way. That that would be a, a reason for you to say, oh, is that actually right? Um, and a good you know, starting point to see, you know, to, to an example for if you are reporting too much or or, or not enough. Yeah. Um, let's see. Is there a good reporting rate nationwide? So go, sort of goes into the other one. Um, uh, again, it's it, like I mean, these all are related. It's really difficult. And maybe talking to the enforcement people, we can find more details. So. I'll do this. I can talk to our enforcement people and find out if they have any type of presentation that may give you more details on the number of inspections and the percent of compliance versus non-compliance from those inspections. Awesome. Yeah, and then there was the last one. It sort of still goes on with the um, the reporting, uh, so you might not be able to answer it, but it says, does the EPA do much enforcement on non-reporting? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, first of all, we do a lot of compliance assistance and try to get companies uh, to report. If the EPA inspects a facility and due to the inspection, there's a complaint against the facility and EPA receives their information, uh, they usually follow up with an enforcement case if they meet their requirements for enforcement. Uh, so I know that that every year, at least when I was working in enforcement, which I did for about eight years, we did about 40, about 60 inspections, uh, sometimes even 100 inspections every year in our region uh, from industries. And I don't know, there was always uh, some enforcement. I, I worked in the Chattanooga Creek Initiative years ago, and I did uh, a good number of inspections, and I found 60% of the companies who are out of compliance. And uh, so we actually had show copies with them. Enforcement, there were actually penalties assessed to those companies and some also uh, community uh, projects done to mitigate those penalties. So yeah, I mean, EPA is always very active in each region of conducting inspections and also conducting enforcement when the circumstances merit it. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Ezekiel, for, for your knowledge sure. and, and for taking time out of your you're scheduled to, to present on this webinar. Uh, I had one question for, for Robert. Robert, whenever you're trying to sell this to upper management to do this big reduction, this big investment, how do you, how do you go about doing that? How do you sell it and, and prove that this is something that needs to be done? Well, fortunately for us, we were all on the same page in the beginning. We knew we wanted to you know, get out of this use of TCE. But I think you just have to just, you know, have your information and facts together about what impact you're making and by, you know, reducing or eliminating where you're going to end up, you know, what that impact will be on the positive side. Awesome. Well, and thank you again for um, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you got a lot of stuff going on, um, especially with, you know, the sickness and everything that's going on. So I just wanted to say thank you to, to both of our presenters. Um, there was a wealth of knowledge, and I, I very much appreciate you guys taking time. Um, if there's no more questions, then I would like to remind everyone that the recording link to this webinar and the presentation PDFs will be sent out to you uh, in a follow-up 
hopefully tomorrow, if not early next week. Um, this webinar is put on by the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation's Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices. More specifically, um, housed in that is the Tennessee Green Star Partnership Program, which I oversee. And if you've never heard of that, then it is the Environmental Leadership Program for manufacturers in the state of Tennessee. So if you haven't heard of it, you want to know more about it, about it please reach out to me. Uh, I'll give you some information about it, and we'd love to to have more partners around the state. Actually, I'm going to be reaching out to Robert pretty soon. Hopefully, we'll get Schick um, in Knoxville as one of our newest Green Star partners. So I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their schedules um, to listen in and to uh, for the questions. It's very helpful. Um, everyone, make sure to practice your social distancing and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb.